Hey everyone, my name is Ryan Soklaski and I'm the lead instructor of the Cogworks course. In this course, we introduce students to cutting edge technologies and machine learning. Week by week, we break down working with different modes of data. So for example, in the first week, students work with audio data. In the second, they work with vision, so imagery. And in the third week, the students work with natural language processing. This course is all about having students get a hands-on experience with exciting technologies. We try to build everything from scratch in this course. In the first week, they learn signal processing and do feature extraction to create their own song recognition app. In the second week, they do a deep dive into the foundations of neural networks with computer vision applications and create their own photo sorting app based on who appears in the photo. And then lastly, in the language week, the students build their own language models, train word embeddings, and ultimately create a neural network that can do image search by caption. Ultimately, in the fourth week, teams of students aggregate all of the exciting topics that they learn to create their own cognitive technologies. This is a really exciting class where students get to apply mathematics and their keen skills in Python to create powerful technologies. All right, welcome everyone. This is the voice of Ryan Soklaski. I am excited to introduce our first team to present today at The Real Shazam, uh, led by their TA, Sam Carpenter. Hello, um, we're team at The Real Shazam from the Cogworks 2020 course. I'm Nora. I'm David. I'm Audrey. I'm Aparna. And I'm Ramon. And, and I am Sam, the TA for the team. And um, how our week four capstone project was to train a neural network to be able to determine whether a fast face had a mask on or not. And our project was also capable of determining whether two people were adequately socially distant. We decided on this project because of the modern day significance of this issue, stemming from the recent coronavirus pandemic. We think that our model could have useful applications uh, in analyzing the percentage of people who are actively wearing masks and following social distancing guidelines to be able to better predict how coronavirus may spread in certain areas. So for our project demo, we incorporate two pictures that we tested on. These two pictures consist of huge clusters of people. Some of them are wearing masks while others are not wearing a mask. We were able to train our mob to not only identify faces from the group, but to determine whether or not the face is wearing a mask. The program is also able to measure the distance between two people which it will be notified whether um, one person is less than six feet away from the other person, thus breaking the guidelines for wearing a mask and keeping social distancing. Here, you can see that our program works not only on images, but videos as well. The program parses a video frame by frame, processing them in the same way as images, then places place them back to the end user in sequence in real time. The program consists of two different models, one pre-trained to identify the faces in an image, the other to determine whether or not they wore a mask. The first one, FaceNet PyTorch, was trained on the VGG Face 2 dataset of over 3.3 million faces with over 9,000 different people. The second was in developed entirely by us, trained on a custom-built dataset of approximately 1,000 pictures of people wearing masks and 2,000 of people without wearing them. The model was constructed using a convolutional neural network with two convolutions, since this type of network tends to work better with classifying images. After the images go through the convolutional layers, it passes through a dense layer to provide a probability of that image showing a face with or without a mask. The image on the side shows the first training plot with the model created entirely by us. To train a model, the derivatives of each function must be calculated recursively in a process known as backpropagation, with respect to some loss function, in this case, cross-entropy loss. To calculate these derivatives, the computer must sort all functions applied to, the given, to a given variable. But in normal circumstances, it doesn't. It'd be a waste of memory. This is where auto-differentiation comes in. There exists a number of libraries to sort these functions and backpropagate through them. One of these, MyGrad, is developed by our instructor. MyGrad is extremely powerful and fully featured, but lacks some optimization, as we discovered when training our model. As such, we had to port our model to a new auto-differentiation library called PyTorch. PyTorch is written very similarly to MyGrad, but benefits from better optimization and CUDA acceleration. But rather than code running on your computer's CPU or central processing unit, it runs on your computer's GPU or graphics processing unit, allowing it to run significantly faster. 
The same code, the same code that took an hour with MyGrad took approximately 20 seconds with PyTorch, with a final testing accuracy of about 93%. On the left, you can see a portion of the training with MyGrad, 1 20th of what PyTorch trained, with its speed increased substantially over 10 times real time. On the right, you can see the real time speed with PyTorch going through the full training set of 3,000 images. This is especially beneficial when training with on large data sets with and adding more images as we go. In order to compute the distances between the faces identified in the image, we first identified the, first, the position of both the eyes of one of the faces. If we assume that the people in the image are all standing at the same depth and that the distance between their eyes is around the same length, we can approximate the real distance between each of them by finding the distance in pixels between the center of the faces and then multiplying by the ratio of the actual distance between the eyes over the number of pixels between the eyes. For, purposes of this, for the purposes of our project, this method was sufficient. However, it's not a super accurate way to measure, nor does it measure depth. So if we were to move forward with this project, we might look into different measuring methods and measuring with multiple cameras to get depth. All of the media received by our program, regardless of whether it was an uploaded or live image or video, is processed using, using the same function that we wrote. And this function goes through a few steps um, to take a normal image, which you see on the screen in front of you, into one that displays the results of our facial detect, our, our masked and social distancing detection program. So step one, the image is resized to make it easier for the user to view. Step two, boxes are drawn around all of the faces in the image with green boxes indicating faces with masks on and red boxes indicating faces that don't have masks on. Step three, each face is labeled with mask or no mask, depending on their um, classification. And finally, step four, red lines are drawn between the people who are too close together. Any boxes, lines, and text that were added to the original images were added using the OpenCV library, which also enabled us to convert each image into a numerical NumPy array for processing and then display the image from that same NumPy array. Every frame in a video was processed like it was an image and then displayed in real time. Lastly, we have the main file, which is the epic center of all of our functions created. As seen in the video, we were able to construct a menu system where you're able to type in a certain number to access a method that allows the computer to detect faces and identify whether or not the face has a mask. There are a diversity of commands, such as a live stream video that rings an alarm, whatever no mask has been detected in the face, or that people are less than six feet away from each other. This file also imports many modules such as the camera module that programs the webcam to either take a picture or capture a video of the user. It also was able to take in a file pad of either a video or an image to check faces. Thank you for watching our presentation. All right, absolutely wonderful work at the Real Shazam. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay, next up, we've got Team Vegetables led by their TA, Vishnu. Awesome. Hey, we're Team Vegetables. I'm Nadine, and I'm here with my teammates, Junha, Matthew, Jacob, Ria, and RTA Vishnu. So basically, we just conduct, so we compiled a lot of different small projects in order to see how different data sets can affect our models. So the first model Matthew and I will introduce to you is called the Vegetable Identifier. Right, so our model aimed to classify images of fruits and vegetables. So for example, we'd like to classify this as a flat peach. So we created a model with a single dense layer and trained it on a Kaggle data set. And we didn't expect this to work very well for two reasons. The first reason being that um, the Kaggle data set had 132 different types of fruits and vegetables and only 500 images per class. And it's really, really hard to train a model on only 500 images per class, especially when you have that, this many classes. The second reason was that a single dense layer will only memorize what the input is because it's a single matrix multiplication. So for example, when we trained our model, it learned to recognize an avocado like this. Um, so it can't capture any nuances. So we trained it and somehow we were able to obtain an 84% accuracy, which is a really, really high accuracy of all things considering. And it was at this point we realized that something was really wrong with our data set. So when we actually looked at the data set, we found the main problem. And it's that for every class, like all the pictures look exactly the same because they're a picture of the same fruit, same lighting, same background, just slightly rotated. So you can't actually tell the difference between the testing and the training data. So in order to actually test if our model is as accurate as it said, we tried to plug in pictures of our own fruits. So when we plugged in a cherry, the model incorrectly identified it as a cantaloupe. 
And then when we tried to plug in a picture of a tomato, it also incorrectly identified it as coincidentally another cantaloupe. So this is a really good example of why bad data sets can really ruin your model. Because first of all, the data set was like way too small. But then second of all, there's it was way too uniform at the same time. So it doesn't actually work the way we want it to. But we also did a different project that uses a bigger data set, although they had to deal with a different problem, which was mislabeling. So for this project, we did sentiment analysis of Twitter posts. Uh, so we started out with a 1.6 million post data set. Uh, and before we could pass that to our model, we had to do a lot of pre-processing to get it to work. Um, some of the things we did uh, is we got rid of punctuation, we lowercased everything, we got rid of words that we didn't have the glove vectors for, the embedding vectors. Um, and then in order to keep sentences of uniform length, we added zeros in, in order to get the same number of words in the sentence. At that point, we were able to pass it into our model. The sentence structure was the same, so it could work in matrix multiplication. We trained our model and exported it for use in our implementation. Um, so this is a module for our project. We wanted to make sure that the project is in a format that's easier for use um, just outside the file too, not just in the, in the project, which a, mo a module will allow us to do. So, so to go over some of our main functions, we first initialized our model with one convolutional neural network and two dense layers. Um, and we got our parameters from the previously trained model that um, Jacob described. So after we made a function, we an input of a sentence to go through our model to output the correct sentiment. Over here, we tested and implemented our um, code. So we started off by importing our module, which was already prepackaged, like Junho mentioned, as well as our model, which had our trained data. And then we tested it on two random IDs and uh, to see what the true label was and what the predicted label was. And as you can see, both times, the model correctly predicts that it was negative. And overall, we had an accuracy rate of about 81%. Um, but actually, our accuracy rate was a lot higher because looking into our data, we found that a lot of the tweets or, and were mislabeled. So um, our model actually did a better job of predicting um, some of the tweets in there, despite there being discrepancies with the data. And now we're going to talk about a project that had no data set at all to begin with. So for this project, we did music generation through random sampling. Like Rhea mentioned, we didn't find a usable data set for our purposes, so we made our own. Uh, to do this, we spent a couple of hours uh, hand plugging in uh, note names and lengths from sheet music we have in our homes um, into string values, which we then rearranged into usable lists for our model. We were then able to pass our list format into our model and create a probability matrix of which notes come after which notes in histories. Um, we then created a generate function to generate a random uh, sequence of notes and values based on the context of the generated uh, sequence. We were then able to take those note names, turn them into frequencies, and then turn them into pressure values, which can be played through the speakers. We will play a short sample. Uh, we will now look at a project which had a much larger data set, but it was rather limited. Right. So for this project, uh, we created an image-to-image -image recognition model where an input image would, out would generate an output of numerous most related images. So this could have been technically achieved by just looking at each picture and how similar it is, similar it is to all the other pictures. But we wanted to try using captions instead or the word description for the pictures to generate similar pictures. Um, we did this by using the COCO data set, which contains hundreds of thousands of images and their corresponding captions. To train my model for each image in the data set, I generated a set of triples where each triple will have a good caption, uh, which matches the image description, and a bad caption, which is not. To train the triples, I trained, I trained my model using a recursive neural network, and the model achieved an accuracy about, of about 87%. However, when I inputted images of my own, some of the image outputs were unexpected. Um, so this is, this is an example of an image output that was actually good. Um, when I inputted a broccoli soup, it, outputted five images that were kind of similar to the related topic. But when I inputted an image of a cat, it actually outputted somewhat unrelated images. So this might have been due to um, the, the fact that the data set might not have had a lot of images of, of cats um, to train on. So now we're going to be talking about a data set that was too small and how the issue was fixed. 
Uh, for this project, we tried to leverage our knowledge of neural networks to see how it can be applied to a smaller data set of cat images and other objects to see if it could identify the cat images, leveraging some uh, hyperparameter tunings. So we started off by loading in our data set, and there were only 250 images. So 200 were used for training, and 50 were used for testing. And printing out some of those images, these would be the non-cats, and these would be the cats. And then we uh, created our model, which was a three-layer dense neural network. And then we had to tune our model based off of uh, different parameters to see how this could help improve model accuracy. So this included a lot of experimenting with um, batch sizes, the number of neurons, uh, learning rate, and other such parameters. And then in the end, uh, we were able to achieve an accuracy rate of about 74% after training it. and um, this was a lot higher than we expected considering how much training data we had to start off with. And now we're gonna end with a project that had a fairly good data set or a good data set to work with. And we're gonna show how that really produced great results as a result. So for this project, we aim to um, input an image with handwritten digits and then output the digits in the list. So for example, when we input the number 4 million, as you can see here, we should be able to output a four followed by six zeros. So the first tool to do this is we need to be able to identify exactly where the digits are. So for, to do that, we use FloodFill. FloodFill is a breadth first search algorithm. And um, basically we can detect where the digits are and we can detect for each region, AKA which digit, what is the highest pixel, what is the lo lowest pixel, what is the leftmost pixel and what's the rightmost pixel. And then given this, we can draw a box around the image. So then we pass these boxes to detect digits. And what detect digits does is given the boxes, it will look inside each box and then return the, the image inside. So it'll return the list of all the images and all the digits. So for example, this is one of the images returned by detect digits on 4 million. So after getting this list of images, we converted it to be the right dimensions to fit into our model. This model was a convolutional neural network called Lynette, and it had two convolutional layers and two dense layers. We actually trained it using this data set called MNIST. And MNIST is just a bunch of like handwritten digits. But the big key thing about this data set is that there were 60,000 training images and 10,000 testing images. So this is, based, this is way bigger than any of the other data sets that we used. And it also had an accuracy of over 90%. So once it took in all these images, it returned a list of scores and each score was representative of how close that image was to the digits from uh, to a digit from zero to nine. And we would just take the digit corresponding to the highest score, output that as our prediction. So here's an example of the output we got as a prediction, which is exactly 4 million. So this is also a really good indication of like how this data set, which is A, way bigger, B, had no mislabeling, but C, was also really varied, ended up producing a very good model. So we ended up ending this project on a very nice note. Thank you for listening to our presentation. All right, absolutely wonderful work. Thank you so much for that. Um, so next up, we have Team Friend.ly, led by their TA, Megan. Hi, everyone. We're Team Friend.ly, and I'm Venkat. I'm Saya. I'm Rohan. I'm Leo. I'm Andrew. And I'm their TA, Megan. Creating meaningful friendships online has become challenging recently, as everything is going remote. So we wanted to create a platform that could connect people and add positivity to their lives. Friendly connects users based on their own descriptions of themselves to create either one-on-one -on -one friendships or an entire friend group. Additional features include emotion detection, text generation, and biography summarization. We use speech recognition technology to best convey the speech patterns and thoughts of each user. And we use several natural language processing and vision techniques to help match these users together. And just for a fun fact, yesterday when we launched our app, it was actually International Friendship Day, which is quite fitting. To assist in user accessibility, we developed a UI that allows users to more easily utilize the functionalities of our program. Sign in or create a profile will switch to or create and switch to a specified user profile. Find a new best friend displays closest matches to the user. Lift My Spirits is a text generator that outputs a story to Lift Spirits. Find a group displays a group with people similar to the user. Show all friend groups displays all the created friend groups from the database. Rate sentiment of my description identifies the user's biography as positive, negative, or neutral. Rate the emotions of my face identifies the user's picture as positive or negative, and shorten my bio condenses user descriptions to contain key info. We will now cover how all these work in a bit greater depth. 
So one of the packages we used was a speech recognition Python library. Um, and we used that to help us convert spoken word into um, text that a computer could more easily interpret. And so we used for this Google speech to text API. And although um, their stuff, their technology is proprietary, they have released some um, papers that do delineate what they do. So for this API that we used, they use RNNT or recurrent neural networks with transducers, which allow them to combine um, audio input and um, the previous predicted word to together to get a more nuanced new predicted word. So in order to compare the biography text to the rest of the database to find a friend match, we used the bag of words technique, which combines the words from all the text to create a vocabulary. And from that, we calculated the term frequency vectors, which tells us how prominent each word is within each document. So as you can see here, the term frequency can tell us that these two sentences differ by one word. Next, we calculated the inverse document frequency vectors, which tells us how unique a word is across multiple documents. These vectors are then multiplied, resulting in weighted vectors that allows us to understand the importance of a word in comparing multiple texts. Now that we had a means of, of comparison, we could find the similarities between documents and their respective writers. To do so, we took the cosine similarity, which computes an interpretable distance between two given descriptor vectors or people. To create the friend groups, we use the Whispers algorithm. The Whispers algorithm is an unsupervised clustering algorithm. It works in a very straightforward manner. First, we place each individual in their own groups. Then one person is randomly selected. Now we check what other groups does this person belong to and how strong the link is to those groups. As long as the link is greater than threshold, we pick the strongest link and we make that person part of that new group. We repeat this process for a predetermined number of iterations and hope at the very end that a few clusters will be created of similar people. If you look at the right here, this is Whisper's algorithm on a few famous individuals. As you can see here, on top, we have Dr. Fauci all by himself as he's the only scientist or doctor on our list. Then we have the entrepreneurs together, then the presidents, then the singers, and then the actors. And we hope to do this with our users as well to create good fan groups. Next, we have the GloVe word embeddings. GloVe is a model for obtaining representations of words. It was created by Stanford in 2014, and for every word, it gives a 200 dimensional representation. The major advantage with this is that it helps capture semantic meaning and relationship between words. If you look on the bottom right corner here, given the word pencil, it's gonna output words that have similar meaning or are used in similar contexts. And if you look in the up, upper right here, it's, it has similar words that are connected by a line and a line indicating that they have similar meaning, but just for opposite genders. We have utilized glove word embeddings in our representations to make sure that relationship between words are captured. We also trained our own textual sentiment analysis model, which basically measures how positive or negative a particular string of text sounds. So if you look at the example here, when we input the model, uh, a text with positive words, such as happy, glad, hilarious, and so on, the model predicts uh, a value closer to one, which indicates that uh, the text was positive. In the bottom example, you can see that we inputted to the model more negative words, such as depressed, sad, angry, mad, disappointment. And the model correctly predicts that these are negative words with a value close to zero. Uh, the model's architecture contains of a combination of convolutional and dense layers and was trained on examples containing positive and negative Twitter tweets. And we use the MyNN library to, as the back end of this. And the model has an approximately 80% accuracy, which means that uh, when given a biography, the model can correctly predict whether it's positive or negative about 80% of the time. Uh, another feature we had was a biography summarizer, which basically takes a person's biography, which might be like a few sentences to even multiple paragraphs, and highlights key words or phrases that might be uh, unique to the uh, person. So if we have Dylan's biography here, you can see that it contains several sentences such as, uh, how he likes math, how he thinks that dogs can do calculus apparently, uh, how he loves the winter, the snow, campfires, and how he fights for climate change and how he's a teacher. Uh, we split this biography into multiple words and compare uh, these words to all existing biographies already in the database. And we use inverse document frequency to basically rank each one of Dylan's, each one of the words in Dylan's biographies based on how unique they are to him. And we pick um, a top, uh, a certain number of words which are the most unique to him and extract only nouns because nouns are the best part of speech that represent a person's like hobbies, uh, fun facts, or characteristics. 
And you can see Dylan's shortened biography here is Math, Dogs, Snow, Climate, and Teacher. So in order to create our story generator, we used a character-based n-gram model, which predicts the next character in a sequence given the history of the past n minus one characters. So here you can see an example of how the model operates over the word cacao with a history of three characters. We train this on a part of a data set of children's stories compiled by Facebook. The model calculated the probabilities of the successive characters in the training data so that it could generate a story with fairly good grammar and spelling. Here's an example of a story it generated. Another feature that we implemented was emotion detection. So like what Rohan mentioned earlier about sentiment analysis, where he was um, analyzing text, what we did here was we actually um, inputted images and then decided if their facial expression was either positive or negative. So for this, we used a multi-layer CNN and the PyTorch auto differentiation library. And we were able to accurately predict the emotions based off of pictures of faces. So the data set that we used was the FER data set. And so with that, there are seven default classes, happy, sad, angry, fear, neutral, disgust, and surprise. And for that, we achieved about a, a, text, a test accuracy of about 55%, which was okay, but not exactly what we wanted. And so we realized that we didn't actually need all of these classes. And instead we could just um, go off of two classes, either positive or negative. And when we combine the different categories into those two, we achieved a test accuracy of 92%. So the way our model actually works is that um, the user first inputs an image either from their camera on their computer or from an image that is stored on their, um, in their files. And then the empty stand-in model, which is a pre-trained model, pre-processes it by um, copying out all the excess image and then um, focusing only on the face. And then that face was pushed to the CNN that we trained and uh, through that was able to analyze their emotions. So you can see in the bottom, there's the negative faces showing up as negative and the positive faces showing up as positive. Thank you for attending our presentation. We hope you found it interesting. All right, thank you so much, team friend that we, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, so next up we have team Peter led by the TA, Peter. Hi everyone, uh, we're Team Peter and we're really excited to present to you today. So my name is Ines and I'm from Victoria, BC. I'm Austin from San Jose, California. Hi, I'm Rebecca and I'm from Nashua, New Hampshire. I'm Olivia and I'm from Vienna, Virginia. And I'm Sid and I'm from Sharon, Massachusetts. And I'm Peter, the TA for Team Peter. Um, so throughout the month at CalcWorks, we learned a lot from machine learning to audio processing to computer vision and language processing. Um, and we put it all together in our amazing final project, PeterBot. So we'd like to cover a quick uh, capstone in what we learned, and then we'll go right into what PeterBot does and how awesome it is. Um, yeah, so um, we'll first cover like what we've done throughout the course. So this is one capstone project that we worked on, which was image search by caption where the user enters a query in and we can find the images that relate best to the query. So there are basically two parts to this project. The first is model training, where we create data in triplets where we get a, a caption, a good image and a bad image for the caption. And then we use a model that changes these good and bad images into shape 50 embeddings so that we can calculate um, the dot product between the caption and the images to train our model. And then afterwards, we convert the query that the user enters also into a shape 50 embedding. And we take the dot product of this embedding with the images that we've gotten from our model. And we return the four highest values from, we return the four highest dot product values from these multiplications. and those are the images that relate the best to our query. So in this case on the right, if we query giraffe at the zoo, we'll get four pictures of giraffes at the zoo. And sometimes the model doesn't quite work because there's, um, there's more training to be done and more data to be had, but overall it works pretty well. All right, so now we want to introduce you to our final project, PeterBot. Uh, Peter Bot, which is short for Physical and Epistemic Training Assistive Robot, is a health robot that can encourage you to live a healthy lifestyle, both mentally and physically. Um, so among the things that Peter Bot can do, it can critique your yoga poses, 
and can count your calories and also create uh, crosswords and cheer you on with original inspirational quotes. So one of the main features of Peter Bot is to be a yoga instructor, particularly in detecting and classifying your yoga poses. We utilize transfer learning and the pre-trained ResNet model to classify certain yoga poses, such as the mountain and bridge poses, with a total of 10 yoga classes in a data set that we found online. Our model achieved a 97% accuracy on the testing data. We also use the PyTorch implementation of open pose library, which has human pose models that detect up to 18 human body parts shown in the picture on the right. And open pose returns key points that consist of the coordinates of each body part. So to compare if a pose is a good or bad pose, we calculated the angles between each key vector using two key points as the fixed side, such as the side between a person's nose and neck. We then calculated the angles between other body parts and used cosine similarities to compare angle vectors. So um, to be healthy, it's also important to eat healthy, but it can be very not fun to, be, to count calories and nutrients every time you eat. So we decided to make um, a classifier that can take a picture of food and return what type of food it is. We used uh, ResNet 18 to do that, which was pre-trained on ImageNet. It had 20 layers. Um, we originally trained the layer with a data set of 101 classes, but since we had very few images per classes, we did not have a very high accuracy. So then we moved the classes down to six classes. Um, and then we got a higher accuracy of about 65%. Um, we also determined that the reason we had such a low accuracy is because there was a lot of variance between the images as well. Like you would have background in all of the pictures. Some, sometimes there'd be separate food items on a plate. Um, so if we were to continue the project, it would be interesting to look at object detection. So we would be able to uh, isolate the food items more. Um, and then once Peter Bot has detected a food item, it returns the amount of calories, it tells you what sort of nutrients is in it, and it can give you a daily calorie count at the end of every day. So in addition to doing exercise and eating well, we also wanted to make sure that you can um, keep your mental health up as well by taking breaks and uh, strengthening your mind with playing crosswords. So our crossword bot um, uses more like conventional AI rather than like neural nets like our other uh, parts. So conventional AI is using a set of rules to reach the goal and in our case, generate a crossword board. Um, so the way that crossword bot works is that it recursively places blocks on a board um, in order to place them in such a way that it makes a board that uh, follows the typical crossword rules. And then after that, it then recursively solves the board to provide you with a word bank that is um, that provides like a certain le uh, level of challengingness. Um, so as you can see here on the right, um, at the top we can see a six by six board and also the word bank. And then on the bottom you can see uh, a, the crossword bot solving a seven by seven board as it goes through that process. Um, so some improvements that we thought about making um, if we were to ex extend this project further were to be were to adjust the heuristic that we use in order to um, encourage the bot to use a wider variety of words because at the moment um, it, the heuristic it uses tends to focus on a specific subset of words, uh, which makes playing a little less interesting. And finally, our last project was creating a bot that would give you inspiration for when you're feeling down. Uh, this model is powered by an engram model. Uh, and how it works is you have a dictionary with each key being a set of n minus one context letters and the values being the probability of each character that can come next. Uh, so this way it's allowed to create a new and original text. Uh, one of our uh, examples is be yourself. Life is 10% what happened. The man who doesn't love you a formula for success. Don't be pushed around you. So as you can see, most of the words are right, but they are there are shortcomings. Um, so it's a pretty simple model, so it doesn't always make sense. And it also depends heavily on data fed into it and certain hyperparameters. Uh, so lastly, we would just like to thank the BWSI staff, uh, our instructor Ryan, and all of the TAs for helping us uh, this summer. Uh, and we look forward to questions during the Q&A session.
All right, thanks so much, Team Peter. We could all stand to be a bit more like Peter. Uh, last but not least, we have Team Spectra, led by their TA, Vaishnavi. Hi, we're Team Spectra, and this is our project, Cogworks Plus Plus. I'm Millie. I'm Rachna. I'm Pranav. I'm Ian. I'm Esther. And I'm Vaishnavi, Spectra's TA. Cogworks Plus Plus is an expansion on the technologies that we developed during the past three weeks in Cogworks. During Cogworks, we learned about audio input, visual input, and text input. Cogworks Plus Plus focuses on striking a balance between these three and making some cool projects in that intersection. In week one, we did audio analysis. So to build off of this in Cogworks Plus Plus, we made an audio transcriber, which takes in an audio recording and outputs the notes being played with the times. So in this image, you can see that we played A4 for three seconds, stopped, and then played it again for another four seconds. This is another example of our audio transcriber on a C scale, played by a tone generator. Now I'll go into a little bit about how it works. Sound is a wave and therefore continuous. And in order to process sound, we must convert an analog, a continuous signal, into a digital or a discrete signal. This is done using Fourier analysis. Fourier characterizes the recording by how prominent a frequency is relative to other frequencies. This is essentially how often that frequency appears within that recording. Fourier is practically the backbone of all audio analysis. With Fourier comes the spectrogram. A spectrogram is a visual representation of sound. On the y-axis, it contains the frequencies, the x-axis contains the times, and the colors display the amplitude. So on this specific spectrogram, uh, yellow means that it's a loud frequency, and dark blue or purple means that the frequency is not present in the spectrogram. The numerical representation of the spectrogram is what we analyze to get the specific notes you see outputted by our program. So now we move on to overtones. When a complex musical note is played, there are overtones that complement the fundamental note that is played. Overtones usually have a higher frequency than the fundamental note. These are some examples of the overtones that you see on the note C3. So now we must just draw the distinction between a tone generator and an instrument. Here we can see a D scale played by a violin. And you can see that the audio transcriber picked up a lot of overtones. That's because an instru instrument has a lot of overtones. That would, that's what makes the qualities of an instrument different from one another. In the prior slides, we used a tone generator, which produces a pure tone, which has no overtones. This poses a problem sometimes because overtones can be louder than the actual fundamental note. However, we successfully fine-tuned our program to account for this and plan to fine-tune this even more in the future. In week two, we learned about image recognition and computer vision. In Cogworks Plus Plus, we expand on that with the movie recognition program, which we call Movie Shazam. It identifies movies by using facial recognition to identify the actors and actresses from a movie still. Then it takes those identifications and uses them to determine the movie being shown. In order to identify the actors, I used a convolutional neural network, which we will explain in depth later, and a very large data set of images of actors and actresses across countries, decades, and genres. In order to identify the movies from the actors, I used a data set from IMDb with the top 5,000 movies and the cast lists associated with all of them. And I found the intersection between the actors identified and the cast list to come up with the final determination. Here are some examples of the program at work. You can see that it correctly identified Speed and Titanic and the actresses, actors and actresses depicted in the photo. However, for Iron Man, Although it correctly identified the two people, it returned a list of possibilities since they appear in many movies together. With the current version of my program, there's no way to con consistently identify which of these movies is depicted, but that, that's something that we're gonna work on for the next iteration. In addition, in Cogworks, we use the same ResNet CNN to implement the Whispers algorithm. This algorithm sorts a group of images into clusters based on the faces it can find in each one. Now, in Cogworks++, it sorts these images into some into subfolders according to their cluster. The base bank functionality behind both of these programs are neural networks. And a neural network recognizes patterns from data and then comes up with a set of rules to classify new information using those patterns. A network is made up of units called neurons and these neurons are divided into layers. Each neuron interacts with the next layer through weighted connections because each connection has a weight or value associated with it. From then on, it's just a lot of matrix multiplication. And neural, new, uh, neural networks use techniques like backpropagation or gradient descent to use training data 
to optimize the weights in order to get the right results and patterns. So the convolutional neural network or the ResNet is just a variant of the neural network that is suited for image recognition and classification. In our project, we used it to create descriptor vectors, which store, uh, which are mathematical representation of face facial features. We then stored some of those descriptor vectors and associated them with names in a database so that when we submit a, a new image, it can identify the name by comparing the two mathematical representations. So to move on, the theme of week three was natural language processing, where we learned how to apply mathematical descriptors to text so that we can analyze it. In week three of Cogworks, we created NBRAM language models and used these to generate Shakespearean text. But the, on our, our next project, a lyric generator takes this a step further, analyzing text word by word instead of character by character to ensure that the output contains actual words. With the audio transcriber Millie talked about earlier, you can play songs from your favorite artists, and now you can write lyrics just like them. This is an example output from the generator, 100 lyrics in the style of Adele, but you can choose from a variety of artists. Speaking of having a variety of artists, the database we trained the model on consists of 20 different artists with about 10,000 lyrics each. The training we're talking about here is essentially just populating a database and doesn't have to do with, the, with things like loss functions and tuning parameters. During the training process, the model scans over the text in windows or segments and calculates the probability of a word appearing after a, a n minus one size batch of previous words, also called the history. In the end, it creates a dictionary as shown in the picture, um, where for each artist, each history corresponds to a list of possible next words in their respective probability. Next, to actually generate text, the user needs to specify what artist they want to generate lyrics in the style of, as well as the number of words to generate. Then, using the language model that corresponds to that artist, the program chooses a word at random, weighted by the probabilities calculated during training. And don't worry, it doesn't just restate the exact lyrics, because each history can be followed by multiple words. For example, in the quick black cat and the quick black dog, quick black can be followed by either cat or dog. So because of this, the generated text has varied. Our final project um, in Cogworks Plus Plus was sentiment analysis trained. So to do this, we trained a dense neural network on about 1.5 million tweets, where the input was a mathematical representation of the phrase or tweet, more on that later. And the output was both a negative ranking and a positive ranking. Whichever ranking was higher is the ranking that the model would guess. So for example, the phrase, I love pizza would have a higher positive ranking and as such be marked as positive. Next slide. So to go from the phrase, I love pizza to a phrase embedding that can be used to train the model, we first have to split it up into different words. So I love and pizza. So for each of these words, we have to figure out something called a word embedding, which is a set of 50 numbers that describe each individual word. For example, I could become one, zero, five, and so on. Then we come up with the rest of them for the rest of the words. And to get the final thing that we feed into the model, we have to add them up to get a phrase embedding. This phrase embedding can then be passed into the model to determine whether this phrase is positive or negative. Next. We would like to thank Ryan Zaklaski, our Cogworks instructor, for teaching us and creating Python like you mean it. We'd also like to thank Vaishnavi Adala for helping us with our projects every step of the way and just being amazing. We'd also like to thank all the Cogworks TAs for helping us learn all this material. And finally, the, well, not finally, the BWSI staff for running this amazing program. And last but not least, we want to thank all of you for listening. All right. Thank you, Team Spectra. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you for being in the class. Those were the five teams that were participating in Cogworks. We are going to hold a Q&A session now. And after the Q&A session, we are going to have a, a video by our friend, Adrian Hernandez, 
who shadowed the Cogworks program remotely. Um, so if I could have my panelists turn their cameras on, we have David Masharka and Lillian Long joining us for this Q&A session. Um, David is a former coworker of mine and he now works at Covariant um, doing robotics engineering and AI research for robotics. And Lillian Long is a Cogworks 2017 alumnus and worked as a Cogworks TA in um, 2019. Actually, fun fact, the entire TA staff is, uh, consists of Cogworks alumni which is, I think, really, really cool. So we are going to have a Q&A until about 1.10. Afterwards, we will um, uh, have the pleasure of viewing Adrian's video. So to start off with, we had some great audience participation during the video presentations. Um, first question that we have is for Team Spectra, what do you see as some applications for the Movie Shazam app? Well, um, the way I first thought of it was, um, you know, when you're in a waiting room at a dentist or somewhere else, and they have a little screen in the corner with a movie playing, and you have just no idea what it's from, but you want to watch it when you get home. That was the initial application that I thought of, but I, it could be applied in many different ways, too. Also, if you don't know what the actor or actress is, but um, you recognize them, those are two applications that uh, come to mind right now. Great. Thanks, Rachna. Um, so a, another question that we had from the audience was directed towards at the real Shazam. Um, how would you have to modify your mask detection algorithm to bring it to scale? Meaning um, if we wanted to deploy it in the real world, um, can it be deployed as is or would it need to be updated to be widely applicable? So it could uh, totally benefit from some uh, better optimization. Um, and we could also work on it to work with larger amounts of data so we can process thousands of mass spaces um, in the real life scenario. But um, for the most part, it should work as, uh, as is. Cool, thanks Armand. Uh, for Team Spectra, uh, does the lyric generator account for different genres of songs? For example, country or pop? Um, well, the way we have it, it's not like geared towards different genres. It's mostly split up by artists, but we could definitely try to do that in the future. All right. Um, so for Team Peter, what would you do to diversify the words that appear um, in the crossword puzzle? So at the moment, the way that the crossword bot um, solves the puzzle is by using words that have letters that are most commonly used. So words that have like more E's or more T's in them are seen most often across like all boards generated. Um, and so uh, in order to kind of change that, we would probably have to change like how the words are weighted um, instead of just being solely based on letter frequencies. Cool, that sounds like a good approach. Um, all right, for team friend.ly, why did you use term frequency inverse document frequency for a method to encode each person's description? Um, as opposed to other methods. And now I'll, I'll modify that a little bit because I, you know, I know one of the reasons is that's the method that you used for encoding it. So maybe I can turn that question a little bit and ask uh, what, what descriptive power does term frequency inverse document frequency afford us? Why is that a powerful technique? So the reason why we use TF-IDF descriptors was because we were trying to compare different biographies of different people and try and figure out which people would be most similar. And so in order to do that, we wanted the words in the biographies that were most unique to that person to stand out more. And so the reason why the term frequency inverse document frequency method was the best was because the inverse document frequency can weight the words such, such that the most unique words can be the most prominent in the vectors. Right. Yeah. And so that way, you know, if you have niches emerging, it will really pay attention to those words that don't occur so commonly. Um, so Team Vegetables, um, regarding the MNIST project, the di hand, handwritten, handwritten digit recognition, does your MNIST algorithm identify only if you write uh, digits in a row or is there some leeway there? That's a great question. So the way um, we currently implement the algorithm is it scans the image from left to right. 
So if you have a matrix of numbers, it will read the left column, then the middle column, then etc. Um, the one issue is if you have, you kind of have to align the numbers correctly for it to read correctly. For example, the top, the top left number has to be slightly like a pixel left of the, the second to top uh, left number so that it actually parses correctly. Gotcha. But so, you, uh, but they can fall out of line, like that flood fill method that you use, um, is agnostic to whether or not you're writing in a single row or not. Correct. Correct. So it will identify all the digits correctly. It's just the order might be slightly off if it's not aligned correctly. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Um, so let's see. For uh, let's see at the at, at the real Shazam for the mask recognition. Uh, can you talk to our audience a bit more about the data set that you use? Are there any potential biases in the data set, um, or any shortcomings that you could glean from it? Sure. So basically, we used a combination of data sets from Kaggle for the images. However, there are like many biases, such as the program not being able to identify drawings or like how it doesn't have any false masks, such as people holding their phones up. And also, <clears throat> whenever I tried I'm testing the model by taking a picture of myself with the mask on, it wasn't able to identify myself with the mask because my mask was like lighter color. So that was like one of the bias because the program was only able to like track in people with darker color masks since it's more identifiable. Identif it's more notif noticeable than the lighter color mask. I'll say that in order to correct those biases, we can try to use the whispers algorithm or like use a better um, organized data set so that we can be able to better sort the images into masks and no masks in the future. Thanks, Varna. Um, okay. Uh... Let's see, for, I have a question for team friendly. When you're uh, clustering groups of friends, um, you were talking about the whispers algorithm and how the, you know, based on the edges drawn between the clusters, uh, we can try to find good friend groups. Could you explain to the audience a little bit more what that edge represents or like what, what information is encoded as to whether or not an a ed, edge exists and if it's a heavily weighted edge or not? So an edge is determined from the cosine similarity between the descriptors. And to determine if the edge exists or not, we have to check if that value from the cosine similarity is above a certain threshold. So the threshold is, was um, hard-coded by us. We tried to find a proper threshold that would give a good split and put people into categories of similar people. OK, cool. That's a really elegant use of that clustering algorithm. I think a lot of companies would be very interested in predicting good friendship uh, groupings. Uh, David and Lillian, do either of you have any questions for our teams? And also, I can open these questions up to our TAs as well. So from what I understand of the algorithm, it, uh, your sentiment depends very much on the individual words. For example, if it consists of things like happy or sad, then that will may cause your model to lean like very hard towards you know, positive or negative sentiments. But what about a statement like, I am not happy? Um, so firstly, would that, how would that work? And secondly, if it doesn't work, um, how might you go about making that work? I'll take this one since our group did sentiment analysis. Our model was based on solely like the words that were fed in, not in any particular order. So a phrase like, I am not happy, um, could be misclassified because it would not know that not came before happy and as such that you're not feeling happy um, despite the fact that happy is contained in the sentence. Um, a way that could be used to improve that classification is instead of using just a simple dense neural network like our group used, Instead, you could use um, a recurrent neural network, which would hopefully maintain the order of the words way better than our model did. Right, so that uh, Ian provided a nice dis discussion there of the kind of uh, pros and cons of using a bag of words approach, right? There's a nice simplicity when you dis uh, discard of the grammar and ordering of a sentence uh, and to restore that uh, as you mentioned with the recurrent neural network, 
we can build in the sequential structure of language to try to capture those sorts of, of negations. Thanks for do the you mind response. If we added on a little bit to that. Yeah, please do. Okay, so our group actually, I believe we tested a couple uh, situations much like that. I don't know if we tested that exact wording, but we tested similar things to that. And we are actually able to make it work in some cases because of the fact that we used a convolutional neural net uh, to when it was training, it would have its filter go over the words because instead of like their group did, uh, we didn't have the whole phrase be an embedding we kept track of the individual word embeddings in the order. So we could actually see what order the words were in when we trained. Cool, thanks so much for that, Jacob. That, I'm glad that you all looked into that. That's definitely a good edge case to look into. Um, David, did you have any questions for our um, teams? Yeah, I was curious about some of the failure modes in the mask detection. Uh, so you've mentioned that it will falsely say that you're wearing a mask if you like cover part of your face with your phone or like hold a book up or something like that. Um, are there other failure modes that you've seen? Has it ever uh, said that you are uh, not wearing a mask when you are wearing a mask? I'm curious if you have any other insights into some of the failures and maybe uh, if you can attribute that to the data sets that you are working with. So we found, we found that error a lot when someone was wearing a lighter colored mask. Um, so for example, I have this blue one here and it, uh, it, a lot of times it just didn't recognize it and it took, it took it as I wasn't wearing, wearing any mask. Um, but when I use a, say, just covered my face with a dark colored sweatshirt, it, it would work. Interesting. Uh, so is that representative of the uh, data set? Is, is that mostly dark colored masks it's, as opposed to like kind of light blue, like medical masks and things like that? Or? So far as I could tell, looking through the data set, it was, uh, it was mostly dark colored masks. So I, I do believe that would be de dependent on the data set. I also have to say, I, I did notice in one of the example photos, there was a gentleman far in the background, kind of blurry, who's clearly wearing a mask, but is labeled as, as not wearing a mask. So there does seem to be some resolution issues there as, as well, which is interesting. Um, there's a general question. Um, for all teams, do you plan on sharing your code on GitHub or on other platforms? You can all pile on and say yay or nay. I can answer this for Spectra. We actually made an organization on GitHub with all of our code. Right now, um, I think we still have to add like some readmes and like more of uh, like find a way to get our pickle files in a way that can be access accessible. But we do have an organization, so maybe later on we can show it to you guys and you can check it out. Awesome. For my oh, sorry, <laughs> for my team, <clears throat> we already actually were able to share a project on GitHub, and we have the readme file planned. We also have the alarm sound, but that will come out as a surprise. But even so, I feel like our project is much like even though it has like a lot of flaws and stuff, I'm sure it's more like it's still being able to like test and for demo. Cool. Thanks, Aparna. Yeah, so for Team Peter, we actually have a QR code in our video. And if you hold up your camera to it and you scan it, it will lead you to our GitHub. And yeah, it has all our repos. Yeah, that was such a cool idea. When I saw that, I was like, dang, I need to figure out how to get my QR codes working for me. Um, all right. Uh, and if there's any other teams, please feel free to mention. Yes. So Team Vegetables, we also have an organization on GitHub. It is currently set to private until we get the doc strings fleshed out. Um, but once we have all the documentation done, it'll be set to public. Nice. I like your standards. Uh, team Friendly actually is already public on GitHub. There are some uh, pickle files missing, but if you get access to those, it's already available. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, and so I'll also open the floor to the TAs. TAs, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask to our teams? All right. Oh, Vaishnavi, do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. So I had a question for the sentiment analysis, uh, people who worked on that. So you all trained on tweets. What do you think would happen if you fed in like a couple sentences too? Despite the fact that I'm on your team, I'll answer that one first. <laughs> no, um, this, is, this is for you, Ian, yeah. <laughs> Um, so like just sentences, was that the question? Yeah. So when just you double checking your because model. you kind of cut it. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, if it was just trained on actual grammatically correct sentences, 
I feel like it might be trained slightly differently and um, maybe work better on things that are more complete thoughts. But given the fact that it is just taking in words regardless of order, I don't think that the effect would be that drastic. I think I think I heard another TA uh, asking a question. I might be wrong. Yeah, um, I had a question for the people who worked on n-gram models. Um, was there any? I believe that the people who did used character level n-gram models. Was there any reason you chose to use a character level n-gram as opposed to say a word or phrase level n-gram? Uh, yes. Uh, we used a character level n-gram model uh, instead of a word level n-gram model. Uh, because the number of keys uh, grows exponentially with uh, vocab size and your size of N. Uh, so when we only use character level models, there are only 26 possible characters, whereas there are uh, many words. Uh, and it's also more computationally efficient to just use character level models. Though sometimes there are definitely drawbacks because sometimes you might not get real words. That's a really cool point said. Yeah, it's interesting that like, you know, we have to take a principled approach to how we want to numerically encode this language and do we want to build in words and what are the trade-offs with there? So pointing out the exponential scaling by picking a word-based vocabulary is a really interesting insight. Um, we had another uh, audience question that was asking for Team Spectra. Did a movie Shazam program account for different genres and countries for the movie? Uh, or, and if not, also how does it deal with older movies versus now? Could, could your program deal with movies from the 1950s, for example? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the initial data set that we have of actors and actresses was actually very, very large. It had over 400,000 photos, but because our program couldn't exactly handle that, um, we used a sliver of it. But we try to make it over a variety of countries, variety of genres. But for um, the older decades, we weren't able to use any of the black and white photos because the way that our model is trained, it requires that RGB uh, factor. But we do, uh, I've tried using it on really old movies, really new movies, but um, and it has generally worked, although uh, it has to be in the top 5,000 movies on IMDb, so. <laughs> All right, and uh, for Team Peter, can you adjust the difficulty of your crossword puzzles? At the moment, not really. Um, you can adjust the size of the model, and you can also adjust how many blocks you want to put in. But otherwise, it's kind of variable how hard the puzzle is. That's definitely something that we can look into in the future, though. Yeah, that would be interesting to think about different ways to tweak it. For sure, increasing the size seems to would seem to make it harder to begin with. So I think this is a good time for us to wrap up the Q&A session so that we have enough time to watch um, Adrian's video. Um, I want to give a hand to all of the students who just presented. So awesome job, everyone. You did a really, really great job. Um, so, Joel, if you could queue up the video, um, we're going to finish off with a presentation by Adrian Hernandez, who, as I mentioned before, shadowed the Cogworks program. Um, he constructed a uh, generative adversarial network, again, and did a really impressive job. So let's all enjoy uh, the video he put together for us. The uh, volume is a little soft, so hopefully you can hear it. Hi, my name is Adriana Hernandez, and today I will be presenting my AI project named SMART. First, let's start with a rather oversimplified explanation of what a neural network is. We can consider a neural network being a mathematical function that takes an input and produces an output. On AI, we want the output that the function produces to match other outputs that we have for the certain input that it's taking. So, we take an input, we calculate the output, then we calculate a loss from the output that the network actually calculated to what was the true output from the input that was given, and we backpropagate that loss in order to update the function. We repeat, we repeat this process many times in order to obtain better and better results each time. That is what training a neural network is. For this specific project, what I wanted to do was to generate 
pictures of paintings. And for this purpose, I elected one specific type of network, a GAN, a Generative Adversarial Network. That's what GAN stands for. G, generative, because, well, it generates something. In this case, it's going to be pictures of, of paintings. Adversarial, because it's a system of two networks trying to outsmart each other, the generator and the discriminator. For this example, we can consider the discriminator big deal, being an art critic and the generator an artist. And on this network, the art critic is going to tell or it's going to try to tell if a picture is going to be generated from the artist or generated by an actual artist from the real life, not like the artist network. And then through a training process, they are going to become better and better at this game in order to perform better and to produce best results. Okay, let's explain in more detail how we train GANs or how I train them for this specific purpose. First, I have two sources for the pictures. I have a dataset that is just a bunch of pic real pictures, real images, real paintings generated by real people. And then I have my second source of pictures, my generate generative network, my artist. I'm going to take a picture from the dataset to first train the discriminator and I'm going to tell him this is what a real picture of a painting is. Then I'm going to take a picture generated by the generator that at the beginning of the training is going to look like noise pretty much as you can see in the image and I'm going to tell the discriminator, the critique, the art critic, this is a picture, a painting generated by the network so it's fake. Then by this process the discriminator, the art critic is going to tell, okay, now I can tell pretty much how it is. And for the next step, we train the artist, because at this point, the critic has become better at doing what it does, but the artist doesn't. To train the artist, we basically make it fit a painting to the discriminator, and we mark that painting as if it was real. Then the loss calculated by the discriminator is going to be the loss of the art critique, no, the loss of the artist to actually match a real painting because if it was marked like a real painting and the uh, this art critique was already trained for one step then what it was missing was actually the failure or the loss of the generator the artist to actually create a real painting okay so at this point we know that we're marking things like real or fake but we don't know exactly what is happening on detail. What happens here is that the discriminator, the art critic, it's actually providing more information to the artist from like just if his painting was real or fake. It actually provides information about little details and it tells him it is it looked fake because of this and it looked real because of this. So now when the artist is optimizing, optimizing itself there's actually going to be some things on itself that he's going to increase because that was what the art critic told him that was good about his work for this example and there are parameters that he's going to decrease and this repeated cyclically it's going to create the artist to generate better paintings okay so let's talk about the first approach i took about my project by a problem that was generating art itself now my thinking at this point was, okay, I know what a GAN is, so I'm going to fit it pictures of thousands, and I mean thousands, 10,000, to be more precise, images of art that I got from a data set of a museum. And I'm going to tell the generator to actually train to replicate this. So that was what I did, and these were the results that I got. Okay, here are my first results. As you can see, they like if you look them from pretty far away far away you could say that they are real paintings but they are not figurative paintings and you cannot spot people on them or special objects they're just like paintings abstract paintings that's what they look like i mean they're sharp and definitely the network got to capture many of the results many details but they don't have like specific objects with them like here are more examples and as you can see they still look like abstract paintings although they look sharp and like if you look them from very far away you could 
say that they're real paintings. But at this point, I realized something when looking at my data set because I was like, why wasn't this network generating the results that I wanted? And what I realized is that while I wanted results that looked like this, people pretty much was what I wanted. I had a lot, and I mean a lot of images of this, of images that could be considered art, but weren't exactly what I was looking for on my data set. And when I mean a lot of images, I'm meaning that like, maybe like 20%, 2,000 out of the 10,000 images of my data set were this. And I wasn't going to delete this all by hand. So I needed to rethink what, I, what my goal was and what was my method to get to it. Here's my second approach. Now, I'm taking the first, the first architecture of network that I had before. The same network that I used to generate the images of paintings before, I used it to generate something else. Now, I wasn't able to get a pure dataset of the images that I wanted, portraits because after revising the results, I realized that that was like a pretty specific thing that I wanted. I wanted my AI to generate portraits, art portraits. So what I did was, okay, I'm going to generate pictures of faces and then somehow I'm going to turn them into portraits. I'm going to put an art style on them. I, at this point I did a new and I'm going to get to that later. So I trained my GAN to generate faces of people and these were the, the results that I got. As you can see, they look pretty much like faces and people and compared to the results from before, you can actually tell there's an object here. And at this point, I already had the pictures of people. Now, the only thing that I needed was to actually convert them or to put an art style on them. And for this, I needed to implement something else, something called neural style transfer. Neural style transfer. To be what I'm going to be using neural style transfer here is to transform the images that I already had of faces into portraits that actually have an art style. Okay, so neural style transfer network, it's different from a network that I already had, the GAN. So for this network, I take a pre-trained BGG19 network that is a network for object detection, and I just, just use certain layers to, of it to extract features of images. For this process, I'm going to need two images. A content image, that is going to be my face image, the face generated by the GAN, and the second image, it's going to be a, an art style image. This one is going to be from an artist of my preference. In this example, I'll be using Van Gogh. Now, for this process, first I pass the content image through the network, and out of certain layers, there are going to be features extraction that are going to be the outputs of certain layers. I'm going to actually save and record those features extracted by the network, the features that it extracted from the content image, and then I'm going to do the same for the painting that I want to extract the style from. Now I have my features saved for those two paintings for the layers that I want of the feature extraction of the pre-trained network. And what I'm actually going to be optimizing is a third image that is going to be at the beginning, the same as the content image. Now I'm going to optimize my image of input. In this case, everything on the network is going to be pretty much fixed. What we actually are going to be optimizing is the input image. And we do this by passing the image through the network that I already mentioned. And for each layer, I'm going to compare the features that were extracted from the input image to the features that were extracted from both the content image and the style image. And I'm going to calculate losses for those. And depending on the losses, on the losses for those features, I'm going to be optimizing the image and repeating this process over and over is going to eventually make the image to become a balance over the content image and the style image. Here's some examples of this process over the same image and with different styles of artists. Here's a quick demo about the final program. You can see that it generates portraits. All right. Uh, thank you very much. 
Um, Adrian, that was absolutely phenomenal work. Thank you so much for sharing your hard work with us and congratulations on a successful project. Um, I want to thank everyone who took the time to support the Coworkers class today and to be part of this uh, celebration of all of the incredible work that these 25 students did and along with my six uh, incredible TAs. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the event. Uh, hey, BWSI, it is good to see you all. Um, I've interacted with a lot of you through the BWSI online course. You probably know me from the Python online course and Pizza Shop, which just rained terror through the masses. So I hope you know how to compute taxes properly now. Um, we don't actually have any awards for the Cogworks class this year because I felt that uh, too much was hinging on students' abilities to edit videos in keen ways. Um, so instead, I just want to express my gratitude to all of the students for working so hard for the four weeks. So actually, truth be told, I was not planning on offering this course virtually this year because of the current circumstances. I thought that uh, taking things online would remove a lot of the special qualities of the course and frankly would be insurmountable. Uh, but the more I started thinking about it, the more I started thinking about how much I would miss this experience and uh, the excitement that I have to meet, you know, 25 plus bright students every single year. So you all are probably too young to have seen Mighty Ducks Part 2, but you should all watch Mighty Ducks Part 2 because it was like that. I was like Coach Bombay and I went through and found all my old teammates, uh, Peter Griggs from 2017. Vishnu, Sam, Darshan from Cogworks 2018, and Vaishnavi and Megan from Cogworks 2019, who formed my elite TA staff. They were absolutely phenomenal this year and really were the keys to success for taking Cogworks virtual. Um, just my unending gratitude to all six of you for putting in so much hard work every single day. Um, and my students, uh, the success of this course is not just because you are all so bright. Um, your willingness to shoulder the added responsibility of taking on a full month of really hard work, your kindness and respect that you show towards each other, your creativity and the energy that you bring to every single day made this entire course possible. If even just a couple of you didn't want to play ball, it would change the uh, nature of this entire thing. But instead, we were all in it together and really eager to see how far we could push ourselves and how many cool things we could learn and have fun while doing it, right? Remember, smiley face and big brain at the same time. Uh, so thank you for making this an incredible experience for me and for everyone else. Um, it is the greatest honor to be able to teach all of you. Um, it is absolutely profound what I get to experience by participating in this with all of you. Um, so it, it means a lot and I hope that we can all stay in touch and that we can help guide each other into the future and to find new and exciting ways to improve ourselves. Um, so next time you go order a couple of burritos, accidentally order a third one for me. <laughs>